Okay, everybody, game is about to start, and we have our first game, actually, between Cloud9 and Tempo Storm. We're currently in the winner bracket semi-final, and, well, this is going to be a good one. This is one of the games that was really highly anticipated by a lot of people. Cloud9, in this case, they ban out Zeratul. They have first pick, first ban, and Tempo Storm, what are they going to do right now? I'm personally really curious to see how exactly Cloud9 is going to draft this, because against other teams, what they've done before is go into a very, very early Muradin. And I'm a little bit curious to see if they, against Tempo Storm they're going to do the same thing, or if they're just going to say, all right, we're going to switch the draft up a little bit, especially since Tempo Storm has actually been more leaning towards a Johanna than a Muradin. Towers of Doom is the map, and Li Ming is being banned out, which would allow for Zul to be taken. And so far, Cloud9 has actually... Wow, I love it. Vikings on Towers of Doom. Now, before a couple of people say, like, oh my god, what's going on? Vikings are a very, very popular pick on Towers of Doom, actually, by quite a few teams. The European teams going into the EU regional finals have been playing with a lot of Vikings, which oftentimes resulted in bans on them. The funny thing is, though, that such a huge, like that such an early pick on the Vikings is a huge commitment and allows the opponent to go for a bit of counterplay, which is one of the reasons why we see a, a false stat taken. He can simply try and chase the Vikings down, and Zul is also locked down by a Temple Storm. So the Vikings themselves don't really surprise as a pick on the map, because the longer you can draw out one of these altar fights, the more experience the Vikings are going to get early on. And another big advantage of that is that once you have the triple altar spawning on the map, you can send Vikings everywhere and try to cap them. But a huge commitment this early, that's a bit, uh, that, that's something that we don't see too often. I mean, there's a massively early commitment to a Viking play. So that is going to be interesting. And Meridian and Thrall are following this up right now. So at this point, we're having uh, Temple Storm with uh, the ban, with the second ban there. There's no range damage on the side of Cloud9 just yet, so they have to really think about what they're going to ban out here. Range damage and healer have not been taken yet. You can ban out a Greymane, for example. Depends a bit on how Cloud9, or how, sorry, how Temple Storm is going to draft for themselves here. But it could definitely head into a Greymane. It could be a Greymane ban that we're going to see there. Tassada is banned out, though. Now, that's interesting. I mean, guys, I don't dare to hope, but are we going to see a Nova? <laughs> I'm just putting it out there. Why else would you ban that Tassadar right now? I feel Tassadar solo with this particular setup. Why would you go for that? There's much better healer with this particular one that we are seeing there. And if you go for the Viking chase, you could actually pick a Nova here. I don't think that they're going to do it, though. I would love it. Nova has been buffed quite a bit, and a lot of the teams have actually been starting to scrim with Nova to just like give her a bit of a shot. I'm talking about the European teams. I'm not quite aware of how exactly the scrims are going for the North American teams right now. So I could have seen that, but I haven't seen her in a tournament yet. I've seen her in a couple of scrims, but that's about it. So Tempo Storm is playing with Rega. That isn't really shocking anybody. I mean, you want to pick Rega away from the Vikings as well, because like that chain healer gets a lot of value with Vikings in play. Uh, later on in the game. Uh, Tempo Storm right now with the next pick, and I mean, we are still missing a tank on their part. ETC has been banned, so Johanna would be the obvious choice. I mean, it's something that Tempo Storm has constantly picked, and they have been very, very rely like very heavily been relying on that hero, especially Sarei, of course, loves to play with the Johanna here, so I could definitely see that again. And yeah, this is going to be a fun one. Ah, okay, they pick Avala first of all. They're going to save Johanna for last, and now Cloud9 with, I suppose, a Greymane. I mean, like, what are you going to go for when you don't talk the range damage? You could theoretically go into a Jaina, I suppose. I mean, Jaina is still around. Greymane is still around in terms of range damage. Lunara is also available, so you can go Lunara if you think that this is going to be a bit better for you. But yeah, Cloud9, they need some uh, more damage on it. It's also going to be interesting to see how Cloud9 is going to play the Vikings. If it's going to be play again, or if it's going to be the longboat. And in Euro, play again is by now like the standard talent for the Vikings. But if you if you listen to Dreadnought a little bit, he really hates play again. He's not really convinced. He wants to see that damage. He wants to see the longboat. And if Cloud9 shares that sentiment, then they are going to go into uh, the longboat now as well and will not go for play again, even though in a big map like Towers of Doom, it gives you... a a lot of mobility, and you can, of course, also try and flank one of those backliners, which is a bit more of a European style, I suppose, at this point. But Cloud9 is going to show us their skills on the Vikings in just a bit. Lunara is the choice here for the range damage. All right. So we have her taken. And with heals, you could theoretically even go into Malfurion here, I suppose. Besides, uh, But Malfurion has the problem that you are forcing him already into a cleanse that takes... Uh, I guess you are... Do you force him into a cleanse? 
Not even necessarily, to be honest with you. Oh, wow, it's Hiranda's the only support here. Tyrande Muradin for the early game would be great, but she's going to have a bit of trouble later on, I suppose, to really deal with all of the damage that can be dished out by a Vala, by a Zul, and by Falstad. So it's an interesting commitment by Cloud9 to go into a Tyrande solo as the solo heal. Then again, if you think about it, Muradin has self-sustain, Thrall does too, and more or less, the Vikings are probably not going to receive too many heals either. Shadowstalk is going to be great because it hits everyone, so that's cool. And Lunara, she has to be very, very careful, and Tyrande is going to try and focus on with the healing power on her, I suppose. But yeah, Tyrande not actually like a horrible choice or anything. I thought they would go for maybe... I could have even seen a Malfurion here, to be honest with you. In this case, with the Vikings around and with everything else that they currently have, the additional lockdown after maybe a Stormbow, I could have seen a Malfurion in there. Um, but of course, Malfurion not really like the main pick hero. And it also feels a bit like with a lockdown attempt and Vala, maybe with an auto attack build, single target damage is going to be a big deal. But this is going to be a great one. Cloud9 versus Temple Storm, guys. Get ready. Temple Storm is, or like in this case, we have Towers of Doom as the map. Let's find out which team is going to take the lead here. All right, everybody, game number one between Cloud9 and Tempostorm. We have our first map, it is Towers of Doom, and to the left side of the map we have Cloud9 with, guess what, King Kofin on Muradin, of course. K1 Pro on Lunara, Dunk Train on Taranda, the only support here for the team. We have iDream on Thrall and Arthalon on the Lost Vikings, a great hero for Towers of Doom. And we're going to find out if they can get that experience lead that they're, of course, aiming for with them. We have on the other side Tempo Storm with Sol John Falstead, Sray on Johanna, Goku on Azul, Ko on Vala, and Six is playing Rega in this case now. That being said, we have, of course, in this case right now as a level 1 talent. Oh, we're already. Look at that. All of the stone has been taken as a level 1 talent. Okay, cool. So, not really what I expected on level 1. But alright, that works. So, um, yeah, going into a bit of a sustained Olaf at the front. Wow, mass damage against I Dream already. And the lockdown with the Bone Prison. And I Dream is down. That was a pretty sweet kill in the mid lane here. The Vikings, of course, already taking position on the lanes. But yeah, that's the lockdown problem that you oftentimes have with that Bone Prison. Zul can do a whole lot of work there. And Zul actually going into Shade as the level 1 talent here once again, which is more or less the standard. Very rarely do we see a different talent taken. We've actually seen a different one earlier today already. KO again with the uh, level 1 going into composite arrow here, so multi shot build for him. And with that, we could see once again like that hybrid build between like multi shot talents on 1 and 13 and auto attacks besides that, even with an executioner, then later on on 16. So there's a couple of potential to really go for that build here again. That being said, though, we have more or less a rotation happening against the Vikings right now, and Arthalon. Yeah, he needs to be careful with those. Olaf has been taken down, and I Dream has to take over at the lane. So the Vikings are, of course, going to come more into play once that we have the first altar spawning on the map. Already we are seeing soldiers hiding in a bush here, making sure that he gets the experience, and as soon as the Vikings just, like, pop up somewhere, he's going to try and take them down. So playing against Vikings is a little bit like whack-a-mole, but you have to actually look for the moles. So it's not just like they're popping up right in front of you and you hit them. You have to actually search for them a little bit and then take them down. It's like a mix between Whack-A-Mole and uh, Hunting Easter eggs. So right now, Sray, oh yes, they're hunting Sray now as well. So in this case, they get their first kill in and still a slight little experience for Ste Tempo Storm though. But the first two altars are now on the map and that suddenly puts them into a very interesting position. Do they rotate Vala down, yes or no? Ko is trying to push this in, Arthalon is there. First few shots are already fired, yeah, boom. Hitting the core, and the Vikings are also getting the second one. So the first two altars have both been channeled by Cloud9, and they get the hits in. Vikings make it possible, but they are slightly behind in experience because of that as well. And that is, of course, one of the things that can snowball in a later stage of the game. That's a very nice move here. Five heroes against four. Boom, it's a double kill. Caffeine is going to fall and going to make it a triple. Mid-air, Muradin gets taken down. And now the Vikings, they have to do their job in the meantime and make sure that they are claiming the experience in the mid and the top lane because that is definitely a little bit tricky at this point. The talents here on level 4, we have Eric the Swift taken. We have the cooldown reduction build again for the Tyrande, who of course wants to make sure that she's going to get the cooldown reduction for her heals and also then later on for the level 10 ability. We're seeing for Shadowstalk. We're seeing at this time a dream down at the bot lane where Eric was just taken down, trying to uh, go for revenge against Soldier. That didn't work though. And again, also the Flow Rider taken on 4 with a Gathering Storm as a level 1 talent. And here comes inside Rome. Death 3 
reach for the scythe increase that we have now too. And as expected, Mantico has a level 4 talent, so indeed that hybrid build between uh, the uh, multi-shot and the auto-attack build. Caffeine already trying to go for Sray, and I mean Sray and uh, Johanna is the only frontliner right now. The Vikings are still everywhere in the map soaking experience, so it's possible for them to actually make these plays here. But in experience, we have still Temple Storm getting slightly ahead. So Cloud9 is falling a bit behind, and that can really be annoying once that you're fighting against the talent lead of your opponent. And that's exactly what happens right now. Level 6 versus 7, and it's only 22 more seconds that Cloud9 has to get that talent. And then we are going to see those Altar spawn. They are going to make that work, though. I mean, like, Arthalon is soaking experience at the top lane. He uh, still has Eric at the bottom, and he's going to soak this, too. So the talents should actually kick in in time. And now we are going to have Cloud9 fighting for those again. Ratma's Blessing on level 7 for Zul. And we have here the Searing Attacks, plus also Cleanse now taken. And the fight is starting. Seven on both sides now. Yeah, it's going to be a one Altar for an Altar. Goku already channeled this one, so it's an exchange of shots. And that keeps us to at 36 points against 28. Already the lockdown against iDream. Oh, he's trying to get away, but there's just not enough heal. Dunk Train does not have the power to really heal out so much damage. The Vikings are trying to close that gap in experience. Arthalon needs to be careful, though, and in the mid lane, he's about to lose already uh, Baylock. But in this case, Falstead is not able to really secure the kill. Only half damage on the Viking. Yeah, Arthalon's still around, but up to the top lane, Sway and Ko taking one of the camps, and Arthalon will, with his uh, Olaf, have to make sure that these two are not now. They're gonna get the damage in and the experience. But so far, the Vikings are still doing a decent job, but you can really tell that when it comes to experience, it's a bit of a problem. That's also because Falstead has the ability to just, like, fly onto the lanes. So basically, what they're doing with this is they move away from lanes, they gather together and move on lanes as five, as four, try to just like get a few kills in, and then once that the minion wave is about to start the eight towers, Falstead just flies in again and makes sure that he can soak the wave. The problem is that now he's getting completely locked down, was way too low here, and with that, Cloud9 is starting to slowly and steadily close that gap in experience that existed, and the Vikings are of course helping with that as well. We see them at the top lane, we see them at the mid lane, the Vikings are currently everywhere. Spin to win is going to help them also with a bit more siege. Caffeine needs to maybe jump away here, gets bone prison and once again eliminated. It was a bit too late on the jump when he saw the bone prison. I'm not sure if he wasn't cool on here, maybe like on his warp toss. But yeah, if he times that properly, then the bone prison is not going to do anything against him. I guess they thought they could go for the camp and if he just stayed on it, he they would be able to take it. But that's, yeah, that's turned out to be not the case. Level 10 versus level 9. And it's very unlikely that we are actually going to see this altar end up in the hands of Cloud9. They are trying to go for their rogue ability, but there comes the stun, lockdown, rain of vengeance, and Thrall gets just blasted into oblivion. Well played here by Team Temple Storm, and they have now eight kills against two already. They're looking strong, they're looking very strong. K1 Pro is poking against Vala, but overall this is just like the play that they need, and there's another four shots that are being fired against the core. Pam, in your face, 28 versus 32. So still a slight lead in for Cloud9 when it comes to that. But when we are talking experience, then it's a very different game. Zul, on the other hand, he might even fall in the middle, but Six is there helping him out. They have now also the Euro abilities. And it is play again. It is play again. I'm liking it. So uh, more of European status being used here when it comes to the heroic. Sundering, uh, Shadowstalk, and Thornwood Mines are being used. Mirrodin without his talent yet. You oftentimes see on this map in particular. Also Haymaker, of course, taken. But he could go into... Uh, Avatar if he needs it, and so far he's actually already died a couple of times. King Caffeine is being focused by the opponent heavily. Again, the lockdown, this time against Lunara, Bone Prison is there, and the kill after the Poison Nova. Yep, Avatar has been chosen, Caffeine is a bit worried about his survivability here, and uh, definitely for good reason. It is starting to become a pretty big problem here for Cloud9 to really keep this on. And it's very impressive to see how well Tempo Storm can actually deal with the Vikings. Yeah, they are playing an incredible game when it comes to that. So right now we're having camps taken all over the place. We're seeing them heading into an early level 13, which is going to give them the talent advantage again. And Arthalon at the top lane is doing his best to just soak experience. Keep in mind, he's not even like attacking too much here. It's just like soaking speed. He wants this wave to be close to the towers so that he can actually make sure that he's not pushing it out. So it's safer for him. If you push the waves out with the Vikings, then you always end up in a situation where the Vikings are going to be very exposed and can easily be taken out by the opponent. If you let the opponent's wave push in against you and you just like stay at uh, roughly in tower range, you are much safer on the Vikings and you still soak the experience. 
But in this case, Soldier is still getting the kill against Olaf at the top, so Arthalon apparently not paying attention for a moment, and Soldier capitalizing on that. Of course, it can be pretty hectic, especially if you have to micro also at the bot lane, or, uh, sorry, in this case, um, of course. What's that dwarf call again? Eric. Eric, exactly. Eric, but yeah, 13 talents. And uh, guys, this is one and a half level against Vikings. And Goku is going to get that channel, and that puts them on even points on the core now. They might even get the kill against Thrall. Stray moves in, is trying to go for the slow. That didn't work. By the way, we have still no channel completed. Caffeine was interrupting that and is stunning Goku again. Eventually, they should get it. Even Mighty Gus is being used, and Caffeine is being attacked. Oh. This is getting tricky. Caffeine is trying to escape. There's the stun. They're trying to go for the counter kill, maybe against Soldier. That didn't work yet. The altar still not channeled. Zul is down. How is Cloud9 winning that fight? I Dream is getting away. K1 Pro is still poking. KO is super low. Has to get healed by the Ancestral. Here comes the stun. Stray is low. So is Caffeine. Soldier is running out of mana. And Cloud9, against a talent advantage, is going to get the channel. Wow! It was incredible. They actually are able to... Now, first of all, they don't lose a hero. It looked like they would lose at least one, maybe even two. But they kill Zul. They deny the shelter to the opponent. They grab it. And now it's 32 points on the core against 24 and level 13 versus level 13. Vala finally has ah, Arthalon at the top, again hunted by a soldier. It's so annoying to go up against the Fawcett as Vikings. And Fawcett actually went into the giant killer now on level 13 as well. Extra damage against Muradin in this fight is going to be absolutely priceless. Problem is that Muradin is also going to try to go for a nice dodge on soldier and a good mighty gust as well. But yeah, it's 13 versus 13 with now a spell shield for Thrall to give him a little bit more survivability. We have Sprint for Tyrande, which is going to make her a lot safer. But again, Thrall in trouble, and well, he's going to fall. He's not even going to try and use his Sundering, first of all because it's on cooldown, but even if he didn't have it on cooldown, he would probably not have wasted the cooldown there either, because, well, there was not really a point to it, he would have died anyways. Already, the Decrepify has been taken now as well, so the additional slow. Frost shot for the slow as well. And guys, if that doesn't spell execution on 16, then I don't know what does. Slow everywhere currently. And we've seen already execution are taken earlier. One of the bell towers has now been taken down, and that puts a five versus three situation in tower numbers into the favor of Temple Storm. Eleven kills against three. The Vikings all over the place. And the one thing that I want to still highlight a bit is that we have nice scythe used by Goku and Azul. One of the things that hasn't really been used yet is play again. So we haven't really seen it too much. Up at the top, actually, it has been used now that I mention it. But we haven't really seen it to, uh, for the Vikings to participate in a fight, for example. That is something that we could see later. And on 13, we actually see Dolaf damage now uh, with like a bit of a burning rage talent. So it's interesting to see that. Normally what we have is also like a jump, of course. And yeah, I'm a little bit curious to see how they are going to play that. Olaf is oftentimes going for the stun on 16 if they, he wants to go for that flank style that I've been talking about a little bit. But we have now level 16 talents versus level 13. And this is actually a massive leading experience again. So unless Cloud9 can repeat the performance from the early altar, then it's going to be a bit of a problem for them. Here comes already Lunara with a poke. Nice shield clear to interrupt the channel. Already Fawcett and Zul are channeling at the right side, and now they have to go for the team fight. But Stray is low, gets healed by the Ancestral, and they're turning it around, but shots are fired. Five versus three, though, because of the situation with the Bell Towers that we have in the game. So we still have a very solid position. Execution, as expected, has been taken. Dream about to fall. Dream! Oh, the Bone Prison and the Reign of Vengeance. Vala is mercilessly taking them on here. Flowing wounds have been taken. The Executioner as well. Let me just take a look at the damage here overall. Vala is currently at 34,000, which is actually putting her in the top spot, even over Falstad with this build here. We have 43,000 damage on Lunara, but it just doesn't translate into kills. And they have level 16 soon, but the Bone Prison is locking down Lunara and then once again. If you don't have a cleanse on uh, Tyranda, well, you can't. But you don't have a cleanse on your support, and if you don't have any kind of burst here, these lockdowns are just so difficult to deal with. Once again, a bell tower dies, and this is of course the second one. I mean, it's six versus two right now. And guys, this is starting to get really ugly for Cloud9. It looked for a long time like they might even be able to fight their way back into this. But now we have 21 points against 27 on the course. We have six bell towers against only two. And we will just see them go for additional camps, try to pressure the core of the opponent even more. And this is going to get extremely nasty. 
16 versus 16, at least in talents. And the massive focus on the talents on Olaf. Nice Mighty Gust. They are trying to jump down. Soldier is trying to go for a kill against Thrall. And I dream is going to fall here. Even the poison overcommitted to the kill. And hell, why not? We see them now with that stun, the large in charge, the large and in charge with the extra stun. Ranger has been claimed, Starwood Spear, Wild Vigor by the way on level 13, uh, sorry on level 7. And on level 13 we saw the uh, giant killer taken. But right now this is of course going to be a bit of a disaster there. Six spell towers against two, Alter on the map. It's still even talents but Thrall is down for another 17 seconds. It should allow them to go for the bell tower here and of course we are seeing even more camps being attacked even though I suppose that KO is going to be abandoned eventually as uh, Six is already moving in. They're not even trying to interrupt. Huh. Well actually Arthalon is there. The Owl is coming to play and Eric is trying to be sneaky so he's going to try and interrupt that at least for now. <laughs> Arthalon runs away. Eric the Swift is quite helpful here. Thrall is back to business. Thrall is back to business and now he uh, comes straight through the tunnel and is trying to have a bit of an impact there. We see Sundering could be used here. Sundering could be used. They're all very low. Reign of Vengeance is ready, by the way. KO needs to be careful. A soldier is low. Six is low. Actually, Temple Storm is incredibly low here. And they go for the potential kill. KO! Oh my god! He gets away. They're trying to go for Fawcett right now. The Owl, but Rhaegar is dead and Cloud9. They're not giving up yet. Trying to go for the kill against Stray, and they get it. It's a double kill. Zul is still down here. One of the bell towers has been reclaimed, by the way. And the second one is being attacked by Arthalon, so it puts them into a 4 versus 4 situation when they finally challenge the altar. And look at the experience. All of a sudden, they are back to business. They were more than a level behind. Cloud9. It looked really like they are getting completely splattered and blasted into the ground, and now they just turn around and they are saying, like, boys, this is how it's done. We were, we were kidding. Like, the last last 10 minutes, yeah, we were, we were just joking, like this is how it's done. So they are half a level away from 20, it's 26 versus 17, and what looked like a snowball for Tempo Storm, and then finally claiming to take the lead not only in experience and talents, but also in points on the core, suddenly translates into an early level 20 for Cloud9, who are completely starting to run this show again, and yeah. They take the structures on those lanes, they have Arthalon up at the top, they could go for the tower here, which would secure level 20 for them, or at least bring them close. And they are already starting to push that in, and they are baiting KO a little bit. Arthalon, master baiter that he is, was trying to go for that, but Vala doesn't fall for it, so moves away. And here's the level 20 now. And with that, we're having the Fury of the Storm taken for the Vikings, and goodbye, Falstead. Falstead dead again. Hunter's swiftness taken as well. Rewind, galloping gate, and of course the bolt of the storm for Thrall. Things are starting to spiral out of control of Temple Storm a bit. They were in a really nice spot. They had control over the game more or less, and right now they're losing exactly that. It takes them still a third of a level to get to level 20, and we still have Vikings on all of the maps. Now it's of course not so much about the experience token anymore, one of the level 20s reach. It's more about really trying to take camps and also trying, of course, to make sure that they push these lanes back. Sway got healed by the answers. Well, that's a 100 second cooldown that they have right now. King Kefin is not letting up though. He's starting to go in again. Sundering! Oh, the indestructible just comes into uh, play in the last moment. Dream is down though. Dream is down, but they get the kill against Johanna. K1 Pro is suffering quite some damage, but they have once again the poison over to deal with, and that could be the end of Dunk Train. Down he goes. 17 versus 26. Three altars on the map, and what is this? This is Viking Paradise. This is exactly where the Vikings are going to get their channels in. Vikings already channeling two altars, going for the third. Guys, they're going to get every single one of them. Or do they? Yes, they do. Bam. A massive barrage of shots is getting fired. That's 12 points against the core. Viking value right there. Play again being used. They're trying to go for a kill, but all of the Vikings are eliminated. Lunara is, uh, sorry, Lunara is still alive and so is Muradin, but everybody else on the team is down. It's five points on the core though. 20 versus 20. We have, by the way, now the mortal wound taken. Not 100% certain if that talent is really the best in this situation. I mean, like, if you get that in just before we are going... I actually don't know if that talent is good here. I personally believe that it's not really too strong. I mean, it's a four-second heal with a Spectral Scythe, and the problem is you basically have to hit the Scythe just before Taranda uses her ultimate. Anything else, and it's not going to matter too much, I feel. So I feel in this case it could go for the Bone Spear, which we oftentimes see as well. But then again, there's a huge focus already on the Scythe, so he's just like following through with it. Zul 
Goku is playing the hero here. He's going to try to use that. Of course, we have Epic Mount on False Set, which he's already trying to put to the test. We have Bolt of the Storm this time taken for Bala, who decided that this is not a game to go for Nexus Frenzy. This is not a game for the extra damage. But in kills, we have 18 versus 7 now. But just look at the damage output here, too. Bala by now has 62,000. It hasn't actually died yet. So that hybrid build between a multi shot build and an auto attack build with the execution on level 16 is really coming through for her. We still have Lunara, though, with the top damage in the game. With 80,000, she is looking phenomenal here. I dream with seven deaths, by the way, on Thrall. Really having a tough game, and that's the reason why. So much damage. The entire, I mean, trying to save himself with the Sundering, but there was just no way. And here comes the Mighty Gust against K1 Pro. Lunara is hopping away. Might actually escape here. Ah, the Bolt of the Storm, and they kill. Well played by KO. Very aggressive, but also very well played. The Fiend and Dung Trainer moving back once again. But we have even more camps now taken at the top lane by Arthalon. And Caffeine doesn't die. They lose another bell tower. Oh, soldier. With a bunny hop here, more or less. Going for the epic mount. But still a pretty solid situation here. I mean, look at the pressure play in the middle. So they are not... It's only one altar on the map. And that's, of course, a bit of a problem for Cloud9. They would like to see more triple altar situations. They're going to get this one, but not in time to prevent the six shots fire. This is getting a fun game. But still... It's six shots five. It was a six. Ver no, actually, sorry. It's five. It's five. It's a five versus three situation that we had. But now another one is being attacked. The boss is being uh, is about to be taken out too. But the problem is that everybody knows about that already. King Caffeine is there. Oh my God! There's no false that. No face checking Busherinos, dude. Oh, KO falling to the Vikings. Tempo Storm, what are you doing? You were in a great spot here. They lose three heroes. Lunara wasn't even with them. Lunara wasn't even with them. Three heroes dead. Uh, make that force. Ray is going to uh, be dead as well. Yeah, there comes Lunara. A bit of beast stepping going on. Oh my god. Yeah, and now they can, of course, like, well, first of all, they can try to get Goku if they see him. Yeah, I'm not quite sure what happened with him, but he was just like standing there. Uh, yeah, that's gonna be four shots. And guys, with this taken, that means there's one last point on that core for Tempo Storm. One last point. Vikings OP OP. So right now, yep, that's the four shots fired. Already Goku seems to be falling to that stun on Olaf. Yeah, and that's a great kill. That means that even when the heroes that they took out before are going to be back, we're still going to see another 30 seconds until they are going to be back in force with five player play players. One tower taken that puts us again into a pretty interesting position because it's a five versus three. Not that it matters anymore. I mean, the only thing that you need is one single shot. That could be a camp that pushes the core. That could be another boss later on. Or it could, of course, be you taking all of the bell towers and just getting sing one single shot in. And that's probably the biggest threat right now for Tempo Storm, which is why they're having in the mid lane now two heroes taking down a bell tower and reclaiming that. But guys, this is basically checkmate. Triple altar on the map with Vikings. Yeah, we kind of know how that's gonna end, don't we? So <laughs> this is this is the dream again. Like they were actually a little bit unlucky that they were only like this is the second triple tower, uh, so triple altar scenario on the map. But yeah, Vikings everywhere, and guys, this is gonna be a game, and we know it, of course. Arthalon is gonna start the channel down at the bot lane. Already does it, and doesn't really matter what happens over here, as long as he channels the top, he's gonna be. It. This is game, ladies and gentlemen. Well played, GG. Cloud9, they make it happen. 6.5 out of 10, they come back and they take the game against Tempo Storm. Inferno Shrines is map number two. Cloud9 with the lead against Tempo Storm after the first pick Vikings in the last game, which actually played well, played out for them in the end. Tempo Storm is down one game in the best of three series. We are in the winner bracket semi final. So whoever advances now is, of course, finding themselves up against, actually, like at this point, um, I have to double check Team Blaze, of course. Team Blaze, who won against Naventic in the winner's bracket final. The losing team is not out of the tournament yet. They are dropping down in the loser's bracket where they have another shot to reach the grand final. But let's see what's going to happen here between Cloud9 and Temple Storm. Can Temple Storm fight back into this? They have the first ban and the first pick now. And, well, Infernal Shrines is, of course, a map where we have seen a high priority on Falstead. We have seen Falstead even banned out several times. And 
one of the bands that has been pretty consistent has been Zeratul. So Zeratul could be another band that we are going to see here. We have seen the Ming bands, we have seen Zul bands, and in this case, it is the first suggested hero. It is actually Falstaff. So we could still see on the side of Cloud9, Zeratul banned out. I actually feel that even though Zul had a bit of being packed on the last game, they're not really afraid of playing against him. I mean, they won that game with a Toronto as the only support without a cleanse and without like a massive burst heal against like Zul who was trying to lock them down with a bone prison. So that wasn't really, that wasn't, it was pretty well played. I mean, Cloud9 with solid performance there. And Zeratul in this case seems to be their ban unless they switch it around. I mean, as already said before, we have now as the first pick for Temple Storm. Zul as an option, Li Ming as an option, and uh, yeah, Cloud9 is going to take Muradin plus X. Not sure if they are really going to mit, uh, commit to a Zul because I feel like it's not really their style, but we could, for example, see them with a Grey Main here on Infernal Shrines, which is a very good hero to start things off with, considering that Li Ming is taken and Falstead has also been banned out. Muradin is definitely going to be a given, I feel. I mean, I've never really seen Cloud9 go for anything else than Muradin if they got the opportunity to do that. And they do exactly the same thing again. So Muradin, first of all, locked down as the frontliner. And, oh, that's already an interesting touch. No, okay, that makes a bit more sense. Going into the Thrall. Tassadar would have been a bit weird. I mean, yes, Tassadar as a support can definitely be like a good start into things. But putting him in this early would have been quite the commitment. So right now, with Thrall, they already have Mirrodin plus Thrall. That's a very beefy front line that they can run there. We're seeing Tempo Storm with a chance to take Zul once more if they really want him. But I guess at this point, they already realize that Cloud9 is not going to fight for this. And a Sonya. Sonya is actually like a hero that I personally feel is a little bit underplayed on the North American server. We oftentimes see in the European scene that when you see a Thrall, a Sonya is a bit of a counterplay. And even though you don't have to put that much of a focus on uh, this particular dynamic, I really feel that Sonya as a hero in uh, North America does not really get the attention that she usually deserves. Could be picked a little bit more often, but then again, Europe has the same problem with a few heroes as well as, for example, Zeratul, which is not disregarded in Europe, but not as common as he probably should be in drafts. Greymane as a poke damage dealer once again, and that's actually like a very, very damage-heavy setup overall. Sonya as a bruise at the front line, Li Ming and Greymane for a poke. Now that's already very strong. And the question, of course, now remains to see what Cloud9 is going to go and do for damage. They ban out an ETC, which has been a constant today. ETC Sonya is extremely strong. They are completely okay, I suppose, with Johanna being taken by uh, Temple Storm, which they are going to do once again. For Temple Storm, I could see maybe like a ban on a Jaina even. Um, there's a couple of... Like, Lunara could be banned out. Jaina could be banned out. I suppose that for... Oh, wow. They actually prioritized that Zul ban. I mean, if you have a Thrall and a Mirror, then I suppose you have enough lockdown to really capitalize on uh, the Bone Prison. So uh, it feels that Temple Storm is a bit afraid of that, and probably for good reason. But it still allows Cloud9 now to go into their backline, and that is giving them a variety of picks that they can go for. Personally, I would still like to see a Thrall, uh, sorry, uh, a Rega here. Uh, but then again, Cloud9, they have shown a variety of healers. I don't really feel that they are too focused on Rega as a support. It is a chance that they go for him. I mean, they have a couple of options with it. But besides that, range damage is also a very important part now. With Muradin, you can, of course, think about going ma maybe into something like Muradin, Tyrande, and then add also something along the lines of a Jaina to the mix. But we have also as a range damage dealer, Vala and also Lunara still around. So all of these heroes would actually work out for them quite nicely. Vala, if she goes for the hybrid build, can then still use the multi-shot and try to get the extra value out of those fights. <laughs> the murky tease already happening here for Cloud9. Uh, going to try and uh, pull the Clown 9 effect again, but that's, we're not going to fall for that this time. Tassadar is taken, and Tassadar is oftentimes accompanied, of course, by a second support. And if they go for that, then a Taranda would be kind of nice. Because with the Taranda, you would already be in a position where you can run Muradin with a stun, Taranda with a stun, you can run Thrall with a lockdown as well. You need, of course, a burst damage hero then, but that could work. And Uther Tassadar, oh, whoa, whoa. okay, so they really want to keep Thrall alive here. Uther Tassadar as the setup. For Tempo Storm, it's very likely that we're going to see a Rhaegar now. But with Uther Tassadar, you can keep Thrall alive six days a Sunday. Like, this guy is not going to die, at least he shouldn't. With a Divine Shield as the potential uh, heroic ability, Tassadar with all that, what he can bring to the table. Theoretically, Tassadar can go for Arkhan. We've actually seen that occasionally, that a Tassadar went into Arkhan over Force Wall if they felt that they needed more damage, and you can pull it off. It's, of course, a question what's going to be the last hero for them. Uh, we need still damage, and that's Vala, that's Lunara, most likely, one of the two. 
We're having uh, a Tempo Storm going into a Malfurion at this point. Now Malfurion, again, would be an interesting choice at that part, because so far... Malfurion, as I said before, is usually a hero that you try to use against a lot of AoE damage. Again, oh, okay, so Stitches Malfurion for Root after Hook. That makes a little bit more sense, going away from that Johanna that we kind of learned to expect from Temple Storm. Stitches Malfurion would make a lot more sense here because you get the Root after the Hook, so it's a bit of a lockdown move. Oftentimes you do that with an Uther, but Uther has already been taken. Or you could do it with a Taranda, but I feel they were not really willing to commit to a, a Taranda as the only healer with this setup that they're currently running here. But Stitches Taranda can, of course, be very, very nice. So Malfurion it is instead. He still has those heals, of course. He needs to be very careful that he doesn't get jumped. But besides that, if he gets Life Seed, for example, on level 13 and also Enduring Growth on uh, level 7, he gets amazing healing power out there. So Malfurion can actually be a huge asset. Depends a bit on what's going to be the damage that we're seeing for Cloud9 now, because burst damage is Malfurion's worst enemy. He has a bit of a rough time healing against burst damage. AoE damage is something that he can easily deal with. Tranquility is amazing for that. And Cloud9 clowning us a little bit with that Tychus. As I said, boys, we're not going to fall for that. Lunara it is. We talked about her earlier. An alternative would have been Vala. I feel that Jaina would not have really fit the combo that they're currently running here, even though, of course, she adds burst and she also adds, like, a bit of AoE. But you need something that has a bit more sustainable damage out there. And Lunara and Vala fit the bill a bit more nicely. Game number two, Cloud9 is in the lead, and let's see if they can make this a 2 0 of Temple Storm is going to come back into the series. Cloud9 versus Temple Storm, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to go into game number two on Infernal Shrines. Game number two on Infernal Shrines. Currently, Cloud9 in the lead against Temple Storm. And to the left side of the map, we have Temple Storm now with Srey on Stitches, Soldier on Greymane, we have Ko on Liming, Goku on Sonya, and Six on Malfurion. And to the right side of the map, it's I Dream on Uther. We're having currently Dunk Train on Tassada, Arthalon on Thrall, K1 Pro on Lunara, and King Caffeine. I mean, like, I don't even have... Can we just rename the guy into Muradin? Because that's basically that's basically what happens. I've casted, like, so many games of them in the recent past during the end of the Storm history, and I don't think I've seen him on any other hero than Muradin. Every other team is fine with giving him Muradin as a first pick. They're saying, if you're willing to take him as a first pick, then by all means, go for it. But yeah, so he gets that again. Stitches with the Hungry for more. Already the Astral Presence taken. And the 5 versus 5 in the mid lane. And there we go. That's exactly why you pick him out in with this. K1 Pro barely gets away. But you could already tell what's the big deal about the Stitches Malfurion combo. Oftentimes in the past, we've seen Stitches Uther for the same reason. You hook a target, you stun it out. But Uther was already taken away. And if you want to go and do that with Rhaegar, you have to kind of wait until level 16 when you get the Earth Grass totem. And that's a long, long time to wait for that threat so instead they go for Malfurion and they have the root together with the stun you can of course go and do that with a Tyrande as well the problem that you have with it is that Tyrande has a lot less heal than Malfurion after the changes that Blizzard implemented a few months ago I want to say so that's definitely like a big deal here as well Currently down here, another big battle happening with Srey getting a little bit isolated here, but of course he has his Devour. K1 Pro is, the, is doing what you do with Lunara. Oh, King Caffeine with the dodge against the hook. Well done, well done. The thing is that with Lunara, you're always trying to pull. Personally, I cannot express how much I hate Lunara. I hate playing her. I'm horrible on Lunara. I'm probably the worst Lunara that you've ever seen in your entire life. Um, I'm way too greedy to play that hero. Uh, but I hate playing her, I hate playing against her, I hate playing with her in my team, I hate the way that she hops through the map, but she is incredibly strong in the hands of a good player. So, uh, yeah, Lunara is for me like Brightwing 2.0. The two of them have to be kind of related because I have, e like, I despise them equally. But, well, Lunara in this case, actually, like in the last game, she did incredible damage. And the cool thing about Lunara is really, if you have a good player on Lunara that is able to keep himself in the back line, and is just able to just poke, poke, poke. You can destroy a team. You can destroy an entire team. She is like one of the most annoying heroes to go up against, and it is incredible. And so far, Cloud9 has been playing incredibly well with Lunara. We have, in this case, I Dream. It's, it's, for me, it's kind of interesting that we have I Dream actually like here now on the support. It's, of course, like there's a second support that works, but still, uh, considering that we have him usually on a, a bit more of an aggressive playstyle, 
That's kind of interesting to see for now. So again, the poke happening here. KO with level 4 and level 4. We have like both of these teams now heading straight into the additional talent. Sonya and Thrall, by the way, they don't care about what's going on here. They are both AFK top lane, more or less. So they are still locked down into that battle one on one. With now on level 4, the charge blast taken. Oh, Kefin with the whiff on the Storm Bolt. Not hitting that again, Small Fury, but really starting to pressure him. Good shields also from Tassada, even though they don't have the level 7 talent just yet on him. So in this case, we're currently having once more oh, skybound wisp actually taken here so that is an interesting one don't see that every day usually it's the nimble wisp that is coming into play here but a bit of a change two more and then we're going to see the first punisher for tempo storm and they get it plus they get muradin as well they get the kill against him very well done here so at this point as you can already see we have uh, six and ko starting to push at the bot lane everybody else started to rotate on lanes again. so they started to the rotate ro to, to rotate to the lanes again to get the experience so they're starting to take that looking pretty solid for them actually level six already hit and now with the punisher baited this deep into the fort dunk train and capro are going to get the kill against it but it means that six and ko can eliminate the two towers or at least one ah. Yeah, <laughs> second one, come on, Moonburn, there we go. All right, gets that in, well done. Um, Sray is already starting to move in now as well, so let's see how exactly they are going to uh, check that out. Caffeine has lost a few of the towers there as well. Overall, Tempo Storm with a great start. It's one of the things that they are, have been doing in the last game as well. We have, by the way, the rampant growth on level 4 from Malfury, and I love the talent. Better than Loon's Grace in most of the cases, actually. Stray is, on the other hand, going to fall. At least he should. Oh, the heal on Malf. But there comes Lunara. But this time, this is what happens to me and Lunara all the time. I see a kill, I greet for it, and I die. And that's exactly what happens. If you ever end up in a Hero League game with me picking Lunara, then you can basically leave the game already. It's not going to end well for us. Then again, I'm not going to pick Lunara, so don't worry about that. Uh, but yeah, this is exactly what the problem is. They went in for the kill, they wanted Sray, they lost Lunara though. And I mean, it is kind of understandable in this situation. You want to get that kill in. But this is the big problem with Lunara. She's so squishy. She's really, really squishy. She's annoying, but she's squishy. So as long as she moves in and gets these kills, it's great. That's why Thrall is actually so cool with her right now, together with Muradin, because they can create space. If you play Nonara, you want a team that creates space for you. Basically, you need people that peel for you. You need people that just say, like, all right, I'm going to be here. I'm going to take the blunt force of our opponent's setup, and you are just doing damage. I'm gonna, my job is to stay alive and keep them away from you, and you just, like, poke, 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 poke. And that's what she's trying to do. Wild Vigor has been taken as the level 7 talent. We don't have cleanse, by the way. That I find surprising, to be honest with you. I really feel that it's a bit of a misstep to not go for the cleanse. I mean, just look at it. There's the wave of light, of course, that you have there. But do you really need that? I mean, seriously, yes, the cooldown reduction is great. But I don't really feel that you have mana issues with Conjurer's Pursuit already taking level 1. And a cleanse goes a long way against the Stitches hook. And even if you miss it against the hook itself, as long as you cleanse the target that gets locked down by the root, that helps. Personally, I feel that would be a great addition here when it comes to the, the, like the, the talent set that they have to use right now. But they decided against going for cleanse. They're going full force with Boundless Conviction and Wave of Light. And they're going to get those heals in. So yeah, there's already the lockdown. Arthalon gets away though. So he's actually able to jump out of this one. Level 9 versus level 9 in this setup now. And of course, Dunk Chain is going to have to preload those shields again. And that's what he's currently doing. But Tempo Storm has a nice lead when it comes to the numbers in minions. 21 against 6 right now. The position on the shrine has been claimed now though. Soldier is there against K1 Pro. But Goku is jumping in as well with a spear. Soldier is turning around. Sray has to move away though. And this is like really good damage that we're seeing now on the side of T. Cloud9. They're doing well, but Soldier is trying to put more pressure on Lunara so that she cannot jump in. We have slowly and steadily a minion counts rising here for Cloud9, but Tempo Storm is not willing to give that punish up. They're going in again. I Dream is there, goes for the lockdown. They're putting a lot of damage on Greyman now, too, but we have Tempo Storm on point here. They go straight for that shrine again. They have still the surplus in minions. The Arcane Orb misses, though, so that we can take those away. The Fiend is there up at the top, needs to be careful, too because he's starting to run out of mana as well and the arcade punisher is controlled again by Tempo Storm. Cloud9 decides that it's better for them to give that up. 
So instead of greeting for the uh, Punisher and saying like, hey guys, we need to fight this somehow, they're saying, guys, this is getting too risky, let's get out of here. We can let that go. They're going to take a bit of a lead. Let's just make sure that we don't die, and then we're going to take it from there. But they need 10, and now they have it. So we have Pudric Bile taken, Wrath of the Berserker. Here comes at the same time the Thornwood Wines. They're seeing Uther hesitating a bit on his level 10 talent. Divine Shield would be the option that we would expect, but you could theoretically with a double support also decide to go into the stun if you feel that you get enough value out of it. And yes, it's the stun. Divine Storm has been chosen. I'm liking it. Oh, the arcade sent is everywhere. Hydrian decides that they need a bit more stun here, and I actually like that a lot. With Thrall around, with the Sundering, with everything that they currently add, they have now also the Divine Storm added, and that is pretty cool. Good damage, could be more, and a decent stun, so they have a bit of a lockdown attempt. And considering that they run Uther at this point with the Tassadar, you do not necessarily need that Divine Shield. Thrall, of course, would like that. I mean, Arthalon was probably, like, backing, and he was pretty, no, please go for the Divine Shield, I don't want to die. But with the shields on Tassadar, it's completely fine. So, yeah, I mean, like, jokes aside, Thrall, of course, loves Divine Shield. I mean, you want to go ham on him, but still, they have so much sustain and so much support right now. They should be all right. And, of course, he has his self sustain as well. Oh, nice. Look, against Caffeine. He can always jump out. I mean, he should have that. That's where Cleanse comes into play, by the way. But Caffeine gets still away. Who is killing the dwarf? Nobody. That's right. They thought Johanna was taking. That's before they knew Meridian. Uh, I dream, again, at the bot lane here. Look at the experience, by the way. Level 11 versus level 11, so still pretty solid. In kills, this is also not the most kill-heavy game. It feels like we saw a lot more kills than we actually did. It's only three kills in total, but we had a lot of very nice images and fights that we had between the two teams here. So, Caffeine is already starting to like rotate to the top. Stitches is waiting, so the two of them are saying hi. And Caffeine, yeah, of course, I mean, would love to go for Goku. But in this case, Arthalon is already there, and Goku realized that he should stay on the mount there just to be on the safe side. At the bot lane, Srey is starting to move in here now as well. And he actually used his Putric Bile. He used his Putric Bile, maybe a little bit too early. Looked very early, actually. It felt like he thought he was jumped and needed to rush away. And I guess that's kind of the case. But there was not enough lockdown to really punish him. So uh, this is a cooldown that they have now in 30 seconds. So they need to wait a little bit until they can actually use that. And with the Shrine being active, this is a slight problem for them right now. So Stray is currently there, and that will allow Cloud9 to go for that Shrine a little bit faster. They are actually trying to go for Stray again, but already KO had to use his ult. Here comes Soldier. Nice move with that Sundering, isolating Greymane. They're trying to go for the kill against him, but they don't get him. On the other hand, Malfurion is completely annihilated. No chance for him. Even the Divine Storm committed to it. I actually think that was a bit overkill. Soldier is about to fall. Good dodge on K1 Pro. Soldier is dead. Bam. Goodbye, Greymane. That was the poison of Lanara doing work. And now it's level 13 for them. With a double giant killer already chosen. Yes, Ray is going to hate his life in this game. Double giant killer against him. And with that high hit point pull that he, of course, gets. Thanks to the Hungry for more as a level 1 talent. He is going to bleed. They are going to bleed him dry in this game. Holy shock now used as well. Wait, what? Now, that's the talent that I have not seen in a long, long time. So basically, they are going to try to go to like even like snipe opponents harder. The funny thing is that in this case, a shrink ray would have been amazing against Jan. No shrink ray, instead trying to go maybe for a finishing blow every now and then. Yeah, there's the heal. Yeah, Hook is not hitting anything. Caffeine is there, but now Lunara is also starting to join them. No talent taken yet on Tassadar. Prescience is the talent that you would expect, but no, it's the Shrink Ray. They go for the Shrink Ray on Tassadar. Oh my god, I am loving it. Tranquility being used. Caffeine! Ah, Muradin is taken down, and Tempo Storm gets the kill. Good job here from them. So we have them getting the kill now. They have the level 13 as well with the Glass Cannon Limbing, the Unfettered Assault, the Grey Mane, Mystical Sphere chosen. And of course, now you get more kills in against Duntrain. Oh, okay, one pro. Ooh, yeah, he's gonna fall. Lunara is down. Lunara is down, four kills against three. Very even game in that regard, but an experience lead now for Cloud9. And we have the Punisher starting to do a bit of work here, starting to move in against the structures, but of course burst it down quite easily. So with the setup that we're seeing, it's actually also for me personally interesting to see Burning Rage taken. Now what's the benefit of Burning Rage? You get more minions when you fight for the shrines, and you get more damage out against your opponent's frontline when they jump in. The disadvantage is that you're up against the Li Ming that of course is just like trying to blast you into the ground and the Spell Shield would have worked really well there too. 
But in this case, again, I want to highlight that we have Prescience abandoned in favor of Shrink Ray. They know that they need a Shrink Ray against Goku, and they just said, hey, we want to have Holy Shock now and try to just like get a bit more burst in against like single targets. And uh, instead, it's now Tasta who has the job to use Shrink Ray against Sonya during the battle. So that's going to be very annoying for Goku. But yeah, level 15, a little bit faster even for Tempo Storm. They're also in the lead when it comes to the kills. Okay, one brought the bot lane, I still be careful. But this is going to be a very, very sweet game. I'm really liking that we have that adjustment. I mean, Divine Storm, Holy Shock. Could we ask for more at this point? This is going to be really fun. And in stru like the structural advantage of position is still the same, by the way. Now, the single fort has been eliminated in this entire game, and we're talking 13 minutes already on the clock. So that's a big deal, too. When we're talking damage, by the way, I haven't really shown it just yet. But of course, as you would expect, we have currently Nara still with a solid 21,000. Not as much as Thrall, though, who's at 28k. And Li Ming, with a laser show here, is on 31. So, again, split on lanes, especially Cloud9 has to... Well, they are trying to move down to the... Up to, actually, in this case, they're actually trying to look for maybe even a kill on Stray. They're not going to get that anytime soon, I suppose. But we have a nice split now with Nara at the bottom, Thrall at the top, soaking three lanes, trying to go for 16. The next shrine is, of course, going to be announced, and you want to make sure that you have the extra talent. That's going to be the most important. So, the 16 talents, they are ready, and that gives us Benediction. Double Holy Shock. <laughs> Think about that for a moment, didn't even occur to me. Fishing hook, of course, taken. And yes, there it is against Thrall, and he's body blocked. Thrall is body blocked, but there's the double holy light, and uh oh, that could backfire for Temple Storm. They get the kill against Thrall, but they might actually. Nice stun! Really good stun. They're trying to go for the kill, but Malfurion is really bringing some value now. Dream is down. Goku is probably gonna die too. Actually, Goku could stay alive here, and he does. It is a double kill against them. Double kill against Cloud9. Well done, really well done. Trapping Thrall in that case nearly backfired because Thrall was immediately healed by Uther, shielded by Tassada, and they tried to go for the kill, but there was just not enough damage. With the Divine Shield, that would have been a completely different situation, but then afterwards, that stun that we saw through the Divine Storm nearly resulted in a double kill against Tempo Storm, but Malfurion kept everybody alive. That tranquility value right there. And Greymane, by the way, went on level 16 into the Executioner right now. So Executioner taken, Imposing Presence, and the hardened focus on Malfurion, who went into Cleanse, who did not go into the Life uh, Seed, but instead uh, for the Ice Block, and Arthelon and Thrall, I mean, like, now it's a 5 versus 5, but that Punisher has already been claimed. Kefi needs to be careful, okay, there's the Storm Ball, they have to move away. Stray is looking for a hook here, so far not finding one on the other hand. But, yep, at this point, there's still the poke. Oh, the hook and Lunara. Oh, my God. <laughs> Even the Punisher jumping into her face. But, yeah, welcome to the problem. Like, this is the reason why I really said maybe a cleanse would have been good for them. I really expected Uth at least to go for the cleanse to try and uh, cleanse a few of these hooks out. The problem is, if they really say we don't go for cleanse, then they have to position themselves in a way that especially Lunara is not going to be hooked like this. And this is going to result in the first keep. I mean, there's like absolutely no way to save the keep here, as you can already see. That Punisher is, the, he means business, and he goes for it. And they could they get the caffeine. Whoa, Stone Farm, all right, in the last moment. Got actually hooked there as well, but they are still able to get away. Still, Cloud9 is already starting to suffer here a little bit. Temple Storm is playing a solid match with 7 kills against 3 right now, and they are playing a very controlled game, so they are not making really any huge mistakes just yet. It's of course one of those things that can still snowball out of control if you make one mistake that your opponent capitalizes on, but so far, Temple Storm with a very solid play. We have a 5 versus 5 on the map again, and at this point, the only one that has, by the way, not died is actually Tassadar. Tassadar is the only one who hasn't fallen victim to an opponent's ambush yet. He went into the dimensional warp on level 16, so he's at least going to get some uh, hit points back, but Prescience is not going to be a thing for him. Prescience is also one of the talents that has, of course, been a little bit nerfed, more or less. I mean, it doesn't really act... Like, if you get, like, bursted down fast enough and you are, so to say, like, overkill, then Prescience doesn't even trigger every time. So, in this case, the Shrink Ray on him, the adjustment kind of makes sense for them as well. We're having uh, still level 19 versus... I mean, the big deal for Tempo Storm that they were able to get is not only the keep. This is, of course, like a huge effect, uh, like aspect of it. But it's really them also having such a massive experience lead. I mean, we're talking one and a half levels now. And that means early level 20. <laughs> yeah, well, that's not going to work. 
It was a nice attempt, though. It was a nice trap that they set up. I mean, it's something that you have to do. If it works, you look like genius. If it doesn't work and your opponent just pokes you like just happened with a the cocktail, then it looks a little bit silly. But setting traps up like this oftentimes results in you really starting a comeback because you get that kill in against an opponent that is just not expecting it. So that didn't really look too bad for them. We're having Thrall at the top lane, splitting off the rest of the team. I mean, he needs to make sure he gets the experience in here. It's again, like you try to just like, split on the three lanes, you get the experience, you try to close the gap. But the Shrine is now active at the top, or will be in 30 seconds, and that means level 20 versus a level 60 Thanos. There's just no way in 20 seconds to get one and a half levels. It's not gonna happen. Hunter's Blunderbuss, the Temporal Flux, do you really engage into this? I kind of doubt it. I really think they should rotate against the opponent, make sure that they take a few of the structures down and get level 20, and then defend against the Punisher. Because up here at the top, there's still a fort, which is probably going to be attacked. I mean, think about for a moment if actually Cloud9 starts to pressure structures right now. The first thing that's going to happen is that we're seeing Tempo Storm going straight for the fort, having one hero up at the top. That's actually what they do exactly as I say it. And that will allow the Punisher to go straight for the key. But it is at least going to result in a 20 versus 20 fight. So you have a fighting chance as long as you dodge the Punisher. That's currently what they're attempting to do here. So at this point, they're having in the mid lane them already in position. Now there's Dung Train, Kufin, and Arthelon. And this is going to result in a 20. But they are even pushing harder. They're going through the wall as well. Tempo Storm is doing well here. And here comes the 25. Redemption, Rewind, Bolt of the Storm has been taken, Galloping Gate. And we're already having the Rewind now also in Meridian. So they're trying to run this right now. Already the move up to the top. And well, we're having the Arcane Punisher again. So the Arcane Sentries are going to be a huge problem. Sray is looking if he can find someone. Oh, Arthelon barely dodging that hook. That would have been the end of Thrall. But now they can move away. Now the idea that they had is to actually flank uh, Tempo Storm. Tempo Storm is keeping close to the Punisher. The idea is always like separate the opponent's team from the Punisher, try to flank them, let the Punisher go through the keep if need be, but take down the opponent's team. That doesn't work here anymore. It is still 20 versus 20, but the keep is very likely to fall. I would be shocked if it didn't. But still, they might be able to get a couple of kills and defend against this. As long as they don't lose the game, they can win a team fight later and it's gonna be fine. Punisher jumps in, nobody capitalizing on it just yet. Good damage from K1 Pro against Goku. The keep is down. Punisher moves in, gets defended. Caffeine is zoning. K1 Pro needs to be careful. Hook is not hitting anything. Dream was for a moment in trouble. Yeah, Goku gets away. K1 Pro is not following up. This is too much. A bit of damage against Soldier, but Caffeine is just zoning for his entire backline, making sure that nobody is even getting close to them as they try to defend against the Punisher. But this is the second keep that just fell. So keep number two is down, and that will allow now Cloud9 to at least fight. I mean, they're going to try and move in a little bit to attempt... Well, what they're going to try and do is, like, maybe get a kill before the next shrine even starts. But if they have to fight on the shrine, then they are going to take that fight because they have to. They could, of course, always see a bit of a backdoor attempt. Not 100% certain if that would work out. It depends on how far the lanes are being pushed in, but still. So, well... Uh, but yeah, for now we have King Caffeine. Well, they, they take camps. It would be nice for them to take the top camp because that would deep push the top lane a little bit. And backdoors are only a problem if you don't have vision. Like, for example, if the entire top lane is completely pushed in towards the core, then it's very easy for Tempo Storm to start a bit of a backdoor attempt later when the shrine is on because it's a choice that you have to make. Do you commit to a shrine, maybe like at the bot lane, when you don't know where your opponent is and there's a risk that they are going to try for a backdoor attempt? It's 100% on the core, so it's going to take some time, but it, it's always a bit of a risk. Like, we've seen calls like that being made, and it could happen in a scenario like this as well, of course. But for now, the teams are fighting for map control. They're trying to just get all of the cameras that they can possibly get, and right now, we have Arthur and his boys up at the top. The Wisps are always in position. I want to highlight again, by the way, that the Nimble Wisp was actually not taken in this case. That we have right now on level 4, where is it? We have the Skybound Wisp, so you have actually a pretty fun area that you reveal here. It's actually like a really nice, uh, nice division from what we usually see that version. So at this point, again, I want to highlight a few of these talents. Divine Storm, huge deal if you actually get that off against the opponent's team. Just imagine if it's not a hook that Sray gets in, but if actually Cloud9 is able to engage onto Tempo Storm. If that happens and they can go in and suddenly Uther gets a good Divine Storm off, that would be crazy. 
He didn't, by the way, go for the Divine Hurricane. I want to highlight that as well. Divine Hurricane is an insane, insane advantage that you have if you use it. But with all of that pressure against them, Cloud9 decided to go into Redemption instead. And it's an amazing talent. I mean, no questions asked. Shrine is active and it's in the mid lane. And there we have it. Srey at the front lane, zoning for the rest of his team. And Goku always trying to go for a bit of a flank here. If he can get a lockdown against Lunara, that would be amazing. Lunara is trying to get the vision. She wants to know where Sonya is. She sees Goku. Is getting a bit of damage in. Vision has been granted as the Wisp dies. And once again, we have, of course, KO in the back with the Mirror Ball trying to just get some damage in with those missiles. Always poking. Caffeine, Caffeine looking for Muradin. Uh, for Malfurion, finding Malfurion, jumping in, and here comes that fight, the commitment, and here's the Storm, the Storm, but the bolt of the Storm by Six, he gets away, he survives, Tranquility now being used very late, but it works, Dream not down yet, K1 Pro about to explode, Soldiers also rushing away, Cloud9 is incredibly low, but Dream did not die, it's another fight for the Punisher though, and I mean this one would go for Core, they have to fight here, they can't lose the Punisher, they have to go for it, they know that they are low, but they have no choice, Arthur is down this could be game they have to fight it's a bad battle they don't really want to take it but they have to here comes the hook against dung train he gets away besides that we're having pressure against ko he's low in mana as well but of course malfurion is helping him out with it and now it is a punisher and this is going to be game this has to be game 23 minutes in the match the frozen punisher is going to move through the middle of the map 40 more seconds until thrall is going to be back here and this is going to be the 1-1 one, one. we're going to see a third game there is no way to defend against this i just don't see it happen i mean at this point this is really going this is really looking tricky i mean they are trying to go for kills they might even be able to get one but the punisher is already about to go for the core dream is down and that puts a seal on it. Yes, this is going to be it. Resets for Li Ming. Of course, Redemption is still in play, but just look at the core. The Punisher is already at it. K1 Pro is trying to bait him away, and that works for a little bit. It works actually for much longer, but the core is already down to 70%, and they're just simply going for like at this point. Nothing else that they have to do. Very, very well played. And yeah. Cloud9 is doing whatever they can, but it's not going to be enough. It's GG, and that means that we are going to see a third game between these two teams. Pretty well played. GG, and we are going to see map number three between Cloud9 and Tempestorm. Game number three, the decisive map is Tomb of the Spider Queen. Cloud9 faces Temple Storm once again, and this is a very, very different map from what we've seen so far. And we had a very cool series actually already. I mean, Vikings on the first map already, Towers of Doom being played, Infernal Shrines, and that was a pretty sweet. But for now, we have uh, Cloud9 with a ban on Zeratul. So Zeratul has actually not really seen a whole lot of play in this series. We're seeing besides that, Temple Storm. I mean, this is a bit of a different map. Early snowballs are very strong here, so you can actually go for a bit more wave clear overall to just get control over the two turning points and try to just like run with the objective. The first web weaver wave is usually a little bit weaker, but if you get the first web weaver wave and can push to a talent lead, you oftentimes get a second web weaver wave before your opponent turns in for the first time, and then you can start to snowball with talent advantages. Zul is banned out not only because he has that lockdown with the Bone Prison, but also because he has incredible siege power and just like lane push. And that's one of the things that you definitely want to have on Tomb of Spider Queen and you want to deny to your opponent. Cloud9 on the other hand, they're saying like, screw Wave Clear, Muradin is pretty good, right? And Caffeine is probably going to get his wish granted with an early Muradin lockdown here. This is like the pick for Cloud9. The thing is, even if you ban out a Muradin against him, or if like you really screw them a little bit and pick it away, it most of the time hurts you more than it hurts them because it's not like a fiend can only play Muradin, but it's like the hero way is probably the best and they haven't really locked him down yet. So they are actually thinking about changing things up a little bit and for Cloud9 that would be a very big deal. If they start to change it up this early, that's one of these things that would be very, very interesting at this point, but let's see. Um, <laughs> Caffeine probably arguing in voice right now. No, take him. Uh, but instead, a false stat. Yeah, false stat taken. Auto attack build would be amazing on this map. But then again, if you go for the Gathering Storm, you get very, very nice siege. But like, this is actually a pretty cool development because right now, first of all, Cloud9 is saying like, do you think that they actually pick Muradin away? They risk it. Tempo doesn't do it. Thrall Liming confirmed, and here's the Muradin for Cloud9. But I want to talk about false stat for a moment. 
Falsetto in this map was for the longest time a very popular hero because he can get the rotation going with Falsetto between two lanes. And then with your Season Marksman on level 1 and you go into the auto attack build, you get an amazing amount of stacks. So you get really hard hitting auto attacks on your hero. Then again, with Blizzard actually changing the way that Gathering a Storm works and increasing the talent a little bit in stacks that you gather, you have amazing wave clear thanks to that talent if you go into the boomerang build. So for Falstead, this is going for me personally, this is like gonna be the thing that I wanna see right now. This is like the most important thing for me because I feel like these small nuances that you have between games are pretty amazing. And I wanna see why why Cloud9 prioritizes Falstead so highly. He's great on the map, of course. I mean no doubt about it, but is it because they wanna have the auto attack hits? Or is it because they are saying, hey, gathering storm wave clear on this map is really what we need right now, especially when our opponent gets the web weavers, that's what we're trying to get. So besides that, a Turanda is being banned out because Tempo Storm, as Tassada is taken, are a bit afraid that Cloud9 is running a Tassada Tyrande and is going into the stun locks with Muradin. Cloud9, ETC ban, kind of given more or less. Yes, Tempo is most likely going to run that Johanna. We have seen them also with Stitches, but Johanna on this map has better wave clear than Stitches. Unless, of course, you really commit to a, way, to a, like a slam build, then Stitches can help you uh, quite a bit as well. But overall, the notion is just like, okay, ETC with the mosh pit is just like too dangerous. Let's make sure that they're not going to get that. Tempo has some decent damage with, Grey, uh, with Li Ming. I expect to see a Grey main for one of these two teams because Grey main has still very nice wave clear himself and also is, of course, a very strong finisher. As expected, Johanna taken, so wave clear thanks to Knight takes pawn and good control at the bot lane right now. The thing is that Cloud9 doesn't really have a bot lane hero at this point. Falstad with the gathering power could potentially take that role, I'd say, but still. We have Zagara, if she's taken, and the Thrall, two heroes that can actually take over bot lane solo. But in this case, it would most likely be Zagara, and Thrall tried to run the rotation with the rest of the team between mid and top, which is very common for Tomb of the Spider Queen. You have like a, w like a one on one lane at the bottom, and then you rotate to top middle, uh, which is what most teams do. So the Gara locked down, and that is a lot of wave play here already. Cloud9, they have a Tacita. It's kind of likely that they are going to add a second healer to this. If a second healer. Personally, on this map, I really like Rhaegar because the Lightning Shield gives you a lot of wave clear. You can even go for a Lightning Shield build with this. If you go Lightning Bond on level 1, for example, and you get the double Lightning Shield, then you get a huge amount of wave clear. Sylvanas with a level 7 talent Unstable Poison serves, of course, a very dissimilar role. And she is pretty sweet in the sense that she can also like use that Wailing Arrow. We don't see her too often on other maps. Sometimes she's taken on Battlefield of Eternity or on Infernal Shrines because she can just give you so much more pushing power with an Immortal or a Punisher if you can control them, like if you can actually get the objective. Then Sylvanas is amazing, shutting down structures. And it's very similar on this map too. They go for a Vala, Tassada solo support. Yeah, well, if Tassada as a solo support works out for them, then Vala, of course, with that additional wave clear would be quite powerful. So far, it would work out, but Li Ming is a huge threat still. So, uh, yeah, Tassada is going to have his hands full to really heal all of that out, but Cloud9 with a very aggressive setup now in the final map against uh, Tempo Storm. And Tempo Storm, they still need a healer, and they have the chance to jump into a Rhaegar. They could play, actually, once again, on Malfurion in here, I suppose. Uh, with this setup, I like him a lot more than I liked him in the last game. The one in the last game, the last game, it was like the benefit of having the root more or less after the hook, and then the additional heals. So there was great Malfurion play that we actually saw from them. Here, I like Malfurion for a very different reason. You get a combo off of Zagara more into root, and you also have a very nice AOE heal now. And in this case, there's not as much bursty damage on Cloud9. I mean, of course, in theory, they can still like go in with the Meridian Storm Ball, and everybody just like barrels down on target and explodes. But overall, if you think about Vala with a multi-shot talent on level 1, if you think about Falstead with the Boomerang build, like all of these things just whittle down damage and have a lot more AoE focus than a single target usually. And I don't really expect Vala to go for a full auto attack build, maybe a hybrid build, but I don't think it's going to be full auto attack. So Malfurion with his heals should be in a position where he can actually do a lot, and it's very difficult for Cloud9 to jump Malfurion with this particular setup, unless Falstead flies in and gets a good gust off. So guys, we're going to jump into game number three and we'll find out which team is going to uh, make it happen, which team will advance to the winner bracket final, and which of these two teams is going to drop down into the loser bracket. The third and final map between Cloud9 and Tempo Storm is Tomb of the Spider Queen. And to the left side of the map, for Team Cloud9, we have Muradin playing King Caffeine here. 
Dung Train on Tacita, I Dream on Sylvanas, K1 Pro on Falstad, and Arthalon is playing Vala. To the right side of the map at the same time now, we are seeing Tempo Storm with again Johanna played by Srey, 6 on Malfurion. Once more, Goku on Thrall, KO on Zagara, and Soldier is playing Li Ming. So this is going to be an interesting one. Already Barb Shot taken. I'm loving it. I really like Barb Shot on this map. It's amazing against the Web Weavers. It's just that extra damage that you get dish out. You can just burst them down so easily. The hybrid build potentially coming into play for Vala, but on this map it could also be Arsenal on level 4. So we've seen a little bit of hybrid builds already with Vala going into the Composite Arrow on level 1, going into the Frost Shot level 13, Execution on 16, and yada 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 on level 4 Manticore, level 7 Searing Attack. So that's a hybrid build that works actually really, really well. But in this map, Wave Clear is really reigning supreme, so we could actually see this with a full multi-shot build and Vala just like trying to get the wave. The same as also, of course, Sylvanas, who will go for the Unstable Poison on level 7, who burst all of this down. It's a bit of a scary scenario still, with currently Sylvanas down at the bot lane here. Oh, actually, they're flying in with everybody, trying to push a lot of damage on KO. So rotation between the bot and the mid lane. I'm actually liking the adjustment here. We have rotations happening for both of the dreams, but it looks like a dream is going to take the solo lane at the top, which means that he has to be very, very careful. And the teams will always collide in the middle of the map right now. I am also very excited to see that we have Gathering Storm taken. For the reasons that I mentioned during the draft phase already, I really feel that this is a cool choice. Auto attack build, I could have seen that too, but overall I feel this is definitely the better choice that we're having in this case right now. So, as you can see, the bot lane pressure against Sagara doesn't really allow her to set all up a good presence with the uh, creep tumors, so that's a bit of a thing. We're having uh, in the mid lane at this point, ah uh, well, for now, this is basically where the two teams collide, the rotations that are happening. Forza is actually flying in now too. They're starting to put pressure on Goku. Uh, Stormbolt is there. Nice. Really well played. That's a couple of gems lost and really already early aggression on the side of Cloud9. I'm liking the way that they are really running this here right now. So they get the early kill against Thrall, Goku of course, and a bit of trouble there. Arthalon still at the bot lane, playing pretty much solo against KO, but the rotation is coming in every now and then and makes it very much impossible for Zagara to get a lot of things done here. Caffeine is about to help out Falset in the mid lane. And this is really the, I mean, this is really one of so, the really important uh, uh, games. If you are in the winner bracket final and you make it through the winner bracket into the grand final, you don't really get a massive advantage or anything. It's not like you get a map lead, uh, but you still have a lot less games that you have to play. You show a lot less strategies. You are also in a position where you, of course, have still the opportunity to scout your opponents a little bit since you have the opportunity to look at all of the games in the loser bracket. And right now, we have actually the Paralysis taken. Paralysis over Envenom for Sylvanas and the hybrid build as expected for Arthalon. So not going for the Arsenal. He still wants to get some damage into the team fight. So Manticore it is for him. I'm loving this already. Triumphorate has been taken as the level seven, ta as the level four talent now for Li Ming. We've seen so many different Li Ming builds today already, and that's exactly what makes a great hero in a game like Heroes of the Storm. That you have a lot of builds that you can use. That builds are very versatile. Bala is a good example. Li Ming is another one. You can adapt to the situation, and that is the great thing about Heroes of the Storm. Once again, we have a bit of a battle in the mid lane here. Zagara not joining in, and Sylvanas has turned in. So both of the teams trying to get the turn-ins completed. The first turn is of course an important one, and it oftentimes allows you to get a slight lead of experience and then snowball from there. I Dream uh, has to jump away to the Shadow Wave. They're having still at the bot lane a bit of pressure against Zagara, who has to be of course extremely careful. And you can really tell that Kao can't really get too much vision with the creep tumors because he's always getting attacked here as well. Overall already, Kefin needs to make sure that he can't jump out, and he does, all right. The wolf locks him down for a moment, but Kefin is still safe. Has the well up too, and that's not going to become a big issue for him. And at the top lane, Sylvanas is doing nothing. And with the paralysis already getting very annoyed, uh, very annoying here for the towers. And that's, of course, all we're going to increase once that unstable poison on level 7 is hit. This is where we're going to really see the party starting for Sylvanas with her blasting everything away. We have our Flow Rider on level 4 taken. If you've watched a few of the games already today, then you know that this talent is becoming a bit more of a standard with the Gathering Storm build on Falstead. Of course, we, the Power Throw is also a very great tool that you can use. But if you can, if you feel that you're safe enough, just like standing a little bit farther at the front line, then going into the Flow Rider is amazing because you get more Power Throws out and that is going to help you then. Oh, well, not more Power Throws, but Hammerangs, of course. Not 
and then you get, of course, the additional damage in. For now, we have the teams aiming for the turn-in and for level 7. That's like what they're trying to do right now. The level 10 is going to be a super crucial talent, and if one of the teams is able to go into the double web weaver wave, they would be able to, of course, abuse them a little bit to push in. And we all know how Sylvanas can actually snowball on the map like this. So here comes the unstable poison on level 7 for Sylvanas. We see battle momentum for Muradin, having uh, Kalas and Brace coming into play for just just a moment for Tacita. And we have Boomerang plus Searing Attack. It actually shocks me a little bit that Tacita has not taken the level 7 talent. Are we gonna see something else? I have never seen a solo Tassadar without Kala's Embrace on level 7. It's like the talent. It's for me crazy to think that Duntrain didn't take it yet. There we have it. Alright. Very, very late actually. So it takes the talent. And we have now for both of the teams level 7. With conviction taken. And the blue whip waivers are being uh, released. As we have see I-Dream and Arthelon turn. So for them, this is all a question of how much can they push with Sylvanas now. Can they get that lead in talents? Can they get closer to level 10 to secure themselves a second web weaver wave before Tempo Storm turns in for the first time? That's the big, big question for them. And that's the goal now, of course. Once again, we're seeing with the level 7 talents also another battle momentum for Zagara and Seeker. K1 Pro already trying to go for the extra damage thanks to his hammering. We have up at the top where Sylvana. She's currently in the middle being pressured here, of course. Oh, oh Six is going to fall! It's the kill against Malfurion! Well played! They try to go for Stray as well, and they're gonna get that double kill. Oh my god, Cloud9. What a play here already. Well done. The double kill with the Web Weaver Wave, and that means that Sylvanas can just simply go for it and start to disable structures. K1 Pro is there. Goku, of course. I mean, he would love to really do any something about it but right now there's very little that he actually can do they need to get the heroes back in and this is amazing the ming is down as well yep the kill up here arthelon cloud nine is wrecking them right now cloud nine is currently teaching tempo storm how the game is played 10 versus eight one and a half levels they have the heroic ability in the web weaver wave this is the first one by the way isn't even done yet it's still pushing in strafe has been used they're trying to go through the wall now too. The Web Weaver is pushing this in and Sylvanas is going to help them out. It is really happening. The snowball that we talked about. How greedy can you get? 7 minutes keep ink. Now, I don't think that it's going to get that far. But with level 10, they can definitely start to go for a second Web Weaver. They have 55 gems. They have exactly the amount of gems that they need for a second turn in. And there is nothing, nothing whatsoever that Tempo Storm can do right now to contest it. Move in. At the turning point against level 10, the only thing that Cloud9 is going to say, thank you very much for throwing the game completely because we're going to obliterate you right now. You don't even have your heroics up. So we are going to see those turn-ins happening and that's going to be the second web we wave and Tempo Storm is in so much pain. I, like, this is, it, this is going to be absolutely insane. They need 10 fast. They need it fast to defend now. Because if they go, don't get 10 when the second web we were wave barrels down in the mid lane, then they are in even more trouble than I can express here. Soldier, oh my god, like if he dies now, if Soldier goes down, oh my god, Leeming, Leeming dead, Goku down, Malfurion, the reckoning, ladies and gentlemen. The reckoning is at hand. If you have kids watching this, do me a favor and shield their eyes because this is brutal. This is definitely, no, oh my god, this is uh, horrible for Tempo Storm. Cloud9 is completely breaking them. I mean, in this case, we are starting to see them jump in once again. They are starting to take everybody down. And yeah, this is this is just it. Once again, King Caffeine, Arthlon, Dunkrain, they go in. They take the first keep already. They start to move to the top lane. Finally, we have the level 10s in. And at this point, we have Dunkrain, I Dream, and Arthlon already about to open the raid another four. It's 10 versus 10 now, finally. So at this point, Cloud9 has to be careful that they don't go. This is like one of those moments, if you get cocky, you might still lose this game. So that's really important to note right now. If you get a little bit carried away, if you actually get cocky in a situation like this, then of course the problem is still going to be that your opponent can just like go for a team wipe, get the experience back, and then start to really snowball against you. So Cloud9 has to play this safe at this point. They have an amazing lead. It's seven kills against zero. They already went through the first keep before we even hit the nine minute mark. And now they're starting to take even more structures on the map. But now they have to make sure that they're not getting too greedy and fall into a trap here. At the top lane, they obliterate another four, and that's going to give them even more experience. We have level 13 talents now for them coming into play. It gives them another nice lead. King Caffeine is already zoning here. Job 
well done. We're having them now also, of course, with Expansive Fire. There's the Static Shield, Frost Shot, Mighty Gust. Oh, the kill against Savannah. This is the first one for Tempo Storm. Nice heals from Malfurion. And Caffeine has to move away. So even with the level 13 talent there, the kill against Sylvanas was a strong one. And they committed a lot of heroic abilities to get it. Yeah, Tassadar is still getting away here. Caffeine trying to help out a bit, but the Stormbolt misses. They still were able to take a lot of these structures down. And the Red Bat Weavers are now descending. Sylvanas is going to be back in time for that, and that means that she's going to be using her Barb Shot against all of this. So as you can see right now, we have 25,000 damage on Bala alone already, and that's of course mostly thanks to the auto attacks and the strafe. But we also have now 20k damage on Thrall and on Li Ming. So with that being said, we have a very solid setup here, and especially when it comes to siege damage, Sylvanas of course taking the top spot here with 78,000 already. Vala with that multi-shot on talent on level one, still at 63k, so that's not too bad either. Web Weaver at the bot lane already defended against quite easily, and they're starting to rotate into the middle. Keep in mind, there's still no level 13 talent for Tempo Storm, so for them this is a very risky play right now, but they have to risk something. Nice damage from Falstad. Mighty Gust, but the more isolating two. King Caffeine doesn't really care. He jumps in, tries to go for the kill against KO, but once again, Arthalon under pressure. Goku is very, very isolated though. Sundering, defensive, but he dies. Falstad flying into security kill, doesn't even have to, but Arthalon is also dead. And the reset for Li Ming now, of course. Caffeine wants KO, though. Here comes again the Disintegrate. This time actually cancelled very early. Ah, a bit too short on the Stormbolt. Sray is moving away and shielding the rest of his team. He has quite a lot of gems, actually. But I doubt that they are going to be able to take him on. And keep in mind that another Web Weaver is still pushing the top lane. So still is still a lead for Cloud9, but it's getting a little bit smaller. There's not too much that they were able to take down, Tempo Storm that is, but they killed a few of the towers. They were also like getting kills in against Vala and against Sylvanas a bit earlier. So this game isn't over yet. It's still a massive lead for Cloud9. So um, of course, like not even like saying that it isn't, but still, this is one of those things where they have to be a bit careful. Down to the top lane. They have a nice amount of gems, by the way, 34, but you can already tell that they lost quite a few too. They have still 52 on the side of their opponent, so that means that another turn in is possible for Tempo Storm. And now they have their level 13 talents, and that makes them even when it comes to team fights. So, Glass Cannon has been chosen. They're also seeing again uh, uh, on the side of Johanna the uh, extra AoE damage thanks to the Burning Rage, and plus the additional Ice Block on Malfurion. Ah, Goku, Goku, ooh, Vala with a strafe, not enough damage, nice lockdown, but here come the ad. silence is there, the kill against Thrall, silence a little bit too late, already we saw Tranquility used, but the fight isn't over just yet, the dunk train is incredibly low, but Zagara is down, and that is now, once again, a moment to chase down great, dodging the arcane orb, K1 Pro flies in, Sray is dead! No? What? <laughs> now he's dead. Okay, so Johanna finishes the job and everyone else is able to get away. Another fort at the bot lane has been eliminated and that's nearly level 16 right now. Cloud9, they are showcasing why everybody, or why like most people actually, called them the favorite of the tournament and said they are going to take it. They are going to be the champion. They are playing incredibly well right now against Temple Storm. Temple Storm brought them at the brink of defeat and, uh, well, well, they actually defeated in the, f in the second game. In the first game, they still had a really solid chance there, but the Vikings were just a bit too strong in Cloud9's play. Just brought them back into the game with a nice IGN comeback. But in this game right now, Cloud9 is re has really turned up the heat. I mean, we have on level 16 now the Cold Embrace taken. Executioner after Frost Shot for uh, Vala. So as expected, the hybrid build that has been used a couple of times here already. And we're seeing uh, on uh, level 16 a Hammer Rung Talent for Falset who went into Hammer Time once again for the mini lockdown. So the jump on KO, but nice dodge on the Stormbolt. Very well played here. Still the pressure play. The Blue Web Weavers are released and all of these waves are incredibly pushed back as is. So that means once again that we're going to... Oh, maybe... Oh, I dream! I dream is dead, Sylvanas is down, the reset for Li Ming, and that's the worst case at this point for Cloud9. Well, actually, scratch that, this is the worst case. A great more and a double kill. Triple kill for Tempo Storm. They haven't given up yet. Of course, they are still risking to lose their structures here, and that Web Weaver in the mid lane is actually starting to go for the core. But overall, that triple kill, that's exactly what they need. And Tempo Storm, they are fighting. They are fighting tooth and nail to stay in this game now. At this point, we're seeing Sray zoning already, trying to make sure that nobody is able to really brush through these towers. I guess one or two are going to fall, but the important part is that this keep is not going to go down. And Thrall isn't even with him. 
Thrall actually started to take a few of those waves down to the bot lane because he wanted to make sure that they get the experience. So they're starting to make their way into level 16 and they actually hit it. It's 11 kills against 5, but overall Tempo Storm is starting to make this happen. We are seeing them with a Holy Renewal and the hard focus. Again, I dream in a bit of trouble, but dodging nicely here. And this is the battle, of course, that's got to be important. If they lose here, if Tempo Storm loses this fight, then they're not going to have the gems. Then they're going to lose those. But in, I like that Mighty Gust, actually. So in this case, it works quite well. Mighty Gust used after Tranquility, so they are starting to reset that fight. And now, Tranquility is on cooldown. So now the fight is reset. They're starting again from the same position, more or less, because everybody is still on decent hit points. Falstead, on the other hand, is completely isolated, but can shield himself with a static shield. Falstead still down, taken apart by Goku, and this is a 5 versus 4 situation in favor of Tempo Storm, and they are starting to pressure this in. They are trying to get that turn in, and they have the gems. They have the gems for the turn in. King Gafin is still fighting. Nice strafe. More not hitting anything. Stasis keeping Malfurion alive. They're trying to go for the kill. Malfurion! <laughs> They keep him alive, Malfurion is still there. Uh, 50 seconds until he can use Tranquility again. And Cloud9 with a 4 versus 5 is pushing Tempo Storm back. 4 versus 5, and they push them back for now. King Caffeine and Dung Train. Well, they're all moving to the lanes again. They still have a slightly in experience, and they are very eager to keep it. Now, oh, False Falset is also going to be back, and as soon as he can start to fly in once more, that's going to be a pretty important part too. But the turn in attempt at the top lane is again happening. Dung Train cancelling a few of the turn ins, but not all of them. Eight more are needed. Caffeine is there. They're going for it. K1 Pro is arriving at the scene of the crime, and once again the attack, but only 14 seconds until Malfurion has the tranquility back. Mighty Gas is probably going to be saved until then. There's no way for Cloud9 to actually turn in on them for themselves. They have 24 gems, that's just not enough. They need 65 right now. So they are just guarding that turn in spot against the opponent, trying to get the experience, and the teams are both aiming for 20 now. Sylvanas is very far out. I mean, of course, it's understandable that I Dream wants to burst these waves away. Actually, in this case, he's uh, looking at the bot lane now, too. But, yeah, going to take some time to actually take that out. Paralysis is going to help a bit with that. In overall pushing power, 133,000 siege damage are not too shabby. Zegara is at 96 and Johanna at 94,000. But yeah, I Dream is going to get that. They have quite some time here, so he can use that to get the camp. Usually with Sylvanas, it's not really advisable to get the camp solo because it takes a long, long time. But in this case, they had the time frame to do that. But she still has to move straight up to the top now to help out with the battle here. That Wailing Arrow is a huge win condition. If they get that off against Malfurion when they start to jump in before he uses Tranquility, that's like the best thing ever. Already a lot of damage in, and here comes the jump, the lockdown, and Wailing Arrow not used yet. Mighty Gust, no Tranquility yet either. They're starting to go for the battle once again. Arthalon is eating a lot of damage from Li Ming, and at the same time, Six is moving back. Oh, nice isolation attempt here. Saving Six for now. Oh, Kaffeeen! The Wailing Arrow is there! But the Tranquility... Oh my god, these Ice Blocks are Malfurion! Once again, he's keeping himself alive, but not long enough. KO is about to fall. Not taken down, though. I can't believe that he escaped. It's the kill against Malfurion that really sets all of this off. The kill against Malf, and once again, a level lead for Cloud9. That was a very close call, by the way. I mean, I can't believe that, in this case, Caffeine didn't die. Caffeine was so low. He just jumped away in the last possible moment and was able to keep himself alive. This is all happening with Tassila, the only support for Cloud9 against all of this poke damage here. Really incredible play by them. Caffeine, of course, with that sustain on Meridian 2 with his stone form. They're aiming for 20. 10 more seconds. Then Malfurion is going to be back. But until then, they might be able to get a kill. Look at the damage against Soldier. Wow, he ate that full hammering right there. And needed to move back. But also, oh, oh, K1 Pro. Dude, you can't just sit still against the Lumi. Disengage for now. Take it easy. Disengage. Heal up. K1 Pro can fly in again. But the situation is more or less the same. We're closing in on level 20, so that's basically what happens here. But overall, the big play is still turn in for Tempo Storm, yes or no. Defend the turn in points, try to make that work. And, well, this could actually, nice move, Dunk Train actually juking them out, okay, so that works. Well. Soldier, again, ah, well, there we have them. Everybody is again in play, so they're starting again to push them back. Oh, Jana, nice move from Sway. Really well done. Yeah. And Tempo Storm, I mean, they are going in right now. Look at Sway. Like, whoever sneaks past and gets to a turning point can complete it. But once that Cloud9 hits 20, that is a different battle. That's a completely different ballgame. Isolation attempt against K1, bro. That was a whiff thundering. 
A very, very weird thundering in the mighty gust for the disengage. Well played by K1 Throne. That was safe, and now they have 70 seconds in which Thrall is not a massive threat. Of course, he can get the lockdown, but he's not going to get that thundering. Kefin has to move in to interrupt again. They're starting to go for Zagara. Zagara is about to die. Thrall is down. Zagara is falling. Great clap by Kefin. And look at that force wall. That's a work of art. Oh, that's beautiful. K1 Pro completely overshooting with his fly, but it still works. And of course, Malfurion is not going gonna be a challenge for Arthur on solo. Soldier is trying to teleport away, but in this case there is no way for him to escape. It is a quad kill, and this is where Cloud9 wants to end the game. They're going for Sray, the slow is there, Executioner does work. Sray is losing his life. 66k damage on Vala, 60,000 already on Sylvanas, and when we're looking at the 20s, it's already a double Nexus Fancy because they know that they need damage right now. Cloud9, at the end it was a bit more difficult than it seemed at the beginning of the match but they take the series they win the best of three with a 2-1 victory now against their opponent against tempo storm great play and we will see them again in the winner bracket final against team blaze whereas tempo storm drops to the loser bracket of the end of the storm north america And that, ladies and gentlemen, is GG and the end of another series here on Color TV with Heroes of the Storm. So once again, we have another video finished, and I hope that you enjoyed the commentary and that you liked the game, of course, as well. It was a pleasure casting the match for you. And if you guys really enjoyed it, then make sure that you give that video a thumbs up on YouTube. And of course, if you haven't subscribed to the channel yet, feel free to do that too. If you have friends that are interested in Heroes of the Sports esports scene, then definitely recommend the channel to them or just show them the video if they want to see like a bit how the, bro the pros are drafting here especially of course when it comes to the north american scene european scene and i mean these days we even have a couple of chinese games on the channel here so i hope that you enjoy that as well that being said thank you very much for watching again i'm going to see you guys next time with more heroes of the storm content here on the channel have a great day and enjoy your week and see you soon Bye bye